Thanks for taking time to listen to this episode of The Real Rescue Podcast. Take a minute to go to therealrescue.com to check out these and other great deals from our sponsors here at The Real Rescue. This episode of The Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. Access. Because when lives are at stake and conditions are challenging, clear communication is of the utmost importance. Life Saving Systems Corporation. We do our work so you can do yours. Tough gear for tough jobs. And SR3 Rescue Concepts. Because you don't know what you don't know. Breeze Eastern. They dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. Dot com. The Axness PNG wireless ICS system can bring cutting edge wireless intercommunication system technology to any aircraft. The PNG system can be fully integrated into an existing ICS system or can be carried on and off as a mobile base station. They can go anywhere at any time on any aircraft. Plus, with the strongest and most robust waterproof handheld on the market, this system can take a hit and keep working. Their wireless intercom systems are designed to enhance situational awareness through improved communication capability. This system brings superior noise canceling technology to eliminate rotor wash and engine noise from your ICS. The Axness PNG wireless system is currently deployed in more than 1,800 public safety, air ambulance, and search and rescue aircraft worldwide. I have personally used the Axness system in four different countries and on five different airframes. It is awesome. If you want more information, contact them today at axnes.com. That's A X N E S.com. You just make sure you tell them Quinny sent me. Life Saving Systems Corporation. They manufacture the world's toughest helicopter rescue gear. From my favorite harness as a rescueman, the Triton harness, to the rescue baskets, the litters, and of course, the most popular hook in all helicopters, the D-Lock. The team at LSE will cut, bend, sew, weld, and machine these products into existence every day. We do our work so you can do yours. LSC, tough gear for tough jobs. Check them out today at lifesavingsystems.com and follow them on Instagram at Rescue Gear. That's at R-E-S-Q-G-E-A-R. And SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help with your helicopter training, a standardization and safety check, or maybe just an audit or an FAA refresher. They are here to bring your agency up to date with the most current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. The training staff is awesome. With a certified flight instructor pilots, experienced crew members, which I am happy to say that I am one of them, they offer training in rescue, medical, tactical, firefighting, ground operations, and night vision goggle use. SR3 is also partnered with Petzl to assist with personal protective equipment and the highly specific Lazard. SR3 also goes beyond the helicopter world as they provide high angle rescue training and tactical medicine training. Contact them today at sr3rescueconcepts.com or over on Instagram at sr3 underscore rescue. In this episode coming up, I had a blast talking to these guys because for the first time here on this show, I've had an opportunity to sit down with everybody in the crew for this rescue, including guys that had inside intel on the vessel they went to. It was amazing. So please welcome one of the U.S. Coast Guard air crews and their rescue out of Corpus Christi, Texas. My name is Jason Quinn. 
I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Real Rescue Podcast. Uh, today, I, like we talked to Marty Nelson, the last episode, the, this episode, we got the entire crew coming in with an amazing case, and I haven't even heard it. So everything that we're about to hear is going to be raw, and oh, I'm so pumped. So they're going to give us a case which was uh, an involvement with a fishing vessel called the Don Enrique. Uh, the members here, we've got our pilot in command, Mr. Court Kurt. Sa- Sa- uh, Snodgrass, Kurt Snodgrass, is that right? Did I totally mess that up? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, absolutely, yeah. All right, perfect. Great, uh, Mr. Kurt, Kurt we'll Snodgrass. Just, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. And then we have our uh, co-pilot, our SIC. My nickname is Sir. Sir, yeah, Sir, yes, Sir. <laughs> 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 and we know where this conversation is going already. And then in our co-pilot seat, we got Mr. David Gomez. Welcome. Uh, as our flight operator, flight mechanic, Mr. Ernie Ortegon. Did I get that one yes. right? Yes. Yeah, Beautiful. Rescue swimmer, Mr. Marty Nelson. And as a bonus, law enforcement, Boston's mate, Mr. Dempsey La- Lounge. Logue. 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 I messed that up again. Ah, gentlemen, welcome to the Real Rescue. Uh, so here's the deal is it you guys you know marty and i were already on we we had a full conversation about a ton of his cases that he had and what my god you want to talk about blown away Woo! well he gets you like blown away or one. bullshit a little bit of both a little bit of both <laughs> a little bit of both <laughs> the answer to that is yes <laughs> yes, yes the answer to that is yes <laughs> <laughs> well, so he was telling me a little bit about this case and he's like, I, he, I can't do it justice. I got to have the whole crew. So poof, we've gotten all you guys together. So to start us out, Dempsey, give us a little rundown, bring us into the vessel, tag, you're it. All right. So this case is, it's really, it, it epitomizes everything that the Coast Guard's all about. You had, it's starting off with law enforcement. Then it went into all of these guys doing search and rescue. And then you had a boat stranded on the beach, which hit the pollution thing that they had to go down there and deal with. And then these guys had four lives saved and the case built on from there for some uh, human smuggling. So uh, Corpus Christi is a really unique area of responsibility because you have every mission going on, including the international border down with Mexico. And at that time, we were starting to see an increase in human smuggling. Uh, and a lot of those guys are fishermen during the day, but at night, that's when they start doing some shadiness. And uh, so we got a, some law enforcement information from another agency and uh, some of our intel people whenever Coast Guard was starting their intel program. And... Uh, telling us that a certain fishing vessel, the Don Enrique, was suspected of smuggling people north of the, uh, from New Mexico up north of the Port Mansfield cut. And that was one of our busiest areas. So I went and I briefed uh, the ops boss at the time and he, uh, he allowed us to launch a Falcon and I remember that day because it was probably one of the most beautiful days for a flight ever. Uh, had John Bracken, and he was the aircraft commander, and he was the it was his very first flight as the aircraft commander because I remember him saying that. Nice. Uh, Jeff Close was yeah, Jeff Close was in the co-pilot seat, and uh, he was also running some LE ops with me. So he was we were both up there, uh, kind of pre-gaming it and talking about it a little bit and I don't remember who the sensor operator was but it was it was one of the normal guys who was pretty much on every falcon flight I was ever on right on so so we got the call we went up and we flew in a complete sortie about two and a half three and a half hours guys I can't remember the falcon endurance uh I'll go with that that sounds good to me yeah Hey, hey, then, anybody uh, uh, anybody argue with that? No? Perfect. We're going <laughs> to nope. go with two and a half to three hours. <laughs> so uh, we flew around a little more all day. 
up and down all the way to the border and back. And we just, we didn't see the boat. We didn't see it at all. So uh, continued for a couple of days. We briefed all the air crews and all the boat crews that were operating in the area. How do you expect when you have about 25,000 feet, dude? <laughs> well, hey, remember, I was just a passenger. <laughs> The FLIR, it was zooming in. We were zooming in. <laughs> yeah, they were trying, but we were trying. We were the uh, Coast Guard aircraft that was trying to look in because inconspicuous up there, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can't see me now. We were all so loved at that point. So, uh, so we brief up all the air crews and the boat crews and gave them a description of the boat and told them to keep an eye out on it. And two days later, I. I want to say that this was a Saturday or some type of a holiday that these guys launched on. But I remember about 6 a.m. Falcon or uh, Helo's in route. And I just happened to call the command center. I go, what's the name on that boat? They go to Don Enrique. I was like, oh, hell, I'm on my way in. Alert these people, alert these people. This is not only a SAR case. This is a law enforcement case. But, you know, go back to what we do. You know, saving lives takes priority. Yeah. So, so the our, call comes I personally in. Don't remember, I personally don't remember ever getting any kind of a word that there was any law enforcement <clears throat> part of this. I just remember is going to a SAR case. Yep. Yep. And I can take off from there. We got the alert in the morning. So basically about that time in the morning that it that it came in, uh we got the pages on the next tail system. We, we got the pages on the next tail system, and uh, it was for a uh, Kurt and I got the got the page. And we stepped out of the room at the same time, and he's like, "Yeah." He goes, "Let's go to the not ops room. Not the same room, not of course same. not. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it, it came in as uh, as they wanted us to overfly a shrimp boat that ran aground. And they had been talking to the shrimp boat overnight, and they said they didn't need any assistance, uh, but they want us to overflight because of pollution, uh, possible pollution. So um, because it was just an overflight, Kurt said, you know what, Dave, you're, you're in the syllabus, or you're getting ready to start the first pilot syllabus, you take the right seat, you need to get that right seat experience. So I said, okay, let's do it. I was one of the, wait. I'm, I'm one of the unit instructors, so I had the ability to do that. Now, any aircraft commander could let him do it, but I was in a, I was, I was getting ready to train Dave up anyhow. So I thought this would be a great introduction for him. That's actually super smart because you, the opportunity to like, oh, this is just going to be a flyover kind of routine search. And uh, yeah, they're good. We don't have any pollution. Like I check the boxes. And so like your mul multiple things at one flight. I love the idea. Love where you're going. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Kurt and I had, had flown together quite a bit, so it was no big deal. I trusted Kurt. He, he knew my ability, so let's let's do it. So um, we did. We, we, we uh, launched out, and uh, we did find the, find the shrimp boat. But when we got on scene, that's, that's what we – when we saw that uh, the waves were actually crying. It was run aground in, like, the first or second sandbar, and waves were actually crashing over the boat. Oh. And uh, it was to the point where part of the pilot house was actually um, um, crashed in, uh, um, coming down. And when we looked, we could see four body, four people on on board the the shrimp boat in the pilot house that was getting just crushed to pieces by the by the waves. And uh, it was a, a front or something had blown in. And um, I don't know. I don't want to say it was a northern, but uh, maybe it was. Um, but I, I know we were kind of in the hovering part. We were facing sort of, um, uh, you know, Southwest, you know, uh, well, it was so, part of it was to shore, but I don't know. I, it's, it's hard for me to recall that, but I know the winds were blowing. We're looking at 20 to 30 knots of blowing winds, uh, you know, at that time. So the waves were just crashing over this boat. And so we sat there and hovered and that's where, we got into the discussion mode of, okay, um, this isn't an overflight. This is a search and rescue. And I mean, this is a rescue case. Now there's four people on board and if we don't get them, they're going to die. Um, so, um, you know, I'm sitting there right seat, barely brand new. Um, and Kurt, I remember Kurt saying, Dave, you can handle this. 
And so we started discussion. We got Marty on the gunner's belt. We opened up the door. Marty sat in the door. Ernie was sitting there in the door. And we started talking about our plan of what we were going to do. And obviously, we, we knew we had to deploy Marty to the water uh, to get these people. So, and, and in that time, too, I don't know if it was Ernie or Kurt was obviously radioing, radioing Group Corpus, the command center, letting them know that, yeah, we, we, uh, we're, we're actively involved in a rescue now. And so I know that the, uh, Dempsey may know this more, but I know at that point, the command center ended up getting, uh, calling Station South Padre Island because they had actually, uh, because of the law enforcement and the beach rescues and all that, they had vehicles, four by four vehicles and stuff like that, that they would launch and, and respond on the beach. And since we're in the first and second sandbar, I don't know, we're 25, 35 yards offshore off the beach. Um, they, 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 they alerted them and, and Station South Padre launched a ground unit, uh, a big uh, four by four truck with uh, boarding, boarding officers in there. So they were all decked out in law enforcement gear. So yeah, we, we pull into the hover and, and we, get, we get to a point where we start discussing what we got to do. And the biggest part is where are we going to deploy uh, Marty? So what we have is we have a boat that's with the bow pointed toward the beach. The waves are crashing over the port side and we're hovering on the starboard side, starboard quarter of the shrimp boat. And we're sitting there looking and my background is before I became a pilot, um, I was actually a ship driver for two years and I, I was a buoy tender uh, driver. So with that job, the primary mission, you really got to study water currents and how the currents flow over objects because we'd have to pull right up against shore water and pick buoys up. Yeah. So I was, I was keyed in on that. I was looking at where would be a good spot to deploy Marty, you know, in this 20, 30 knot winds and seas that were probably, I don't know, 10, 12 foot waves that were there breaking over the shrimp boat. And um, as I was sitting there, my thoughts were was to deploy Marty in on the starboard side. And the reason I wanted to deploy him there is because my thoughts were, as the waves were crashing over the port side, you had currents of water coming across the bow of the, of the shrimp boat. Yeah. And then you had currents coming across the stern. And there was a V that it was, it, those currents were colliding in like a V on the starboard side of the boat. And my thought was the deploying in the middle of the V. I thought the currents could be the least, were the least there. So from there, I let Kurt take over. That's what I remember saying in the aircraft that I want to deploy him here, right here, Deploy him here and let him try to swim up to the to the starboard side of the boat where the waves weren't crashing and go from there. Let's let's hear right. let's hear yeah. what Ernie thinks about this approach. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Let, hey, come on, Ernie. <laughs> hey, he had the best yeah. view in the house. Let's, I mean, let's face it, he's right yeah. in the door. Yeah. Right I, now. I can see he I can see us right now. Like cabin door is open. You're like leaning out. Marty's trying to look around he's you like, and you're what like, get, get, get back. No, so second. let me let me start. Yeah, let me start from mine before we even right. got there. You know, we're coming down there and we fly over, and I was, the only thing in my head was thinking was, please don't let the outriggers be out. Please don't let the outriggers be out. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's a shrimp boat. It's like, <laughs> don't be out. Don't be out. We fly over. Fuck, they're out. It's like, they're that out. just made this <laughs> entirely, you know, it, it, it changed the game there. It's like, this is going to this is gonna be difficult. This yeah. is going to be difficult. So, yeah, um, Dave, Dave had a ride. We're sitting there. You know, we come in. And he's got his, his damn booms around his outriggers, whatever you call them. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an aviation guy. I don't know oh, these good. both terms. Good. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, open the door. I look down, and and I'm new, by the way, at this point. I mean, I'm just as new as Dave is. We are, we, we're, we're green. Pretty damn green at this point. <laughs> Luckily, wait, wait, we wait, is, not... Out of curiosity, is this your first star case? No. So oh, okay. I, thank I goodness. Nothing. All right. Yeah. He'd <laughs> 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 be like, oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not that, I'm not that green. Right, I'm go, pretty green, go. but I'm not that green. <laughs> But I've never done a surf rescue, so this is my first time ever hoisting into surf. You know, Sick. so okay, cool. Yeah, it's the first time. So yeah, I opened the door and I'm just sitting there like, "What the hell is going on?" Like, <laughs> and it, I hear David and Snotty are talking up there. Kurt, they're talking back and forth about where we're going to put Marty. You know, and I remember them distinctly asking me, "Ernie, what do you want to do?" And I'm like, "Shit, I don't have a clue." You guys tell me where you want him. That's where I'll put him. <laughs> Ernie goes, "I'm, I'm going to push this squirmy little bastard out the aircraft." Get out. I'll, I'll put Marty where you need him, and I'll pick him up. I'm I'm confident in my abilities, but I have no idea what I'm doing in the surf. Oh my so, god! <laughs> those were my thoughts at this point. All right, let, let's go, Marty. What you got? 
So you get on scene now. Well, you, start you know what? Like this was the first misperception in the case. <laughs> David points out a perfectly logical thing saying, Hey, we should go here. And we're like, all three of us look at each other like, no, nah, let's go over here and we'll just kind of use the wave to push us in. And it was it was the wrong approach. We should have listened to Dave. We should have listened because, to Dave. Because uh, he's just, hey, we Dave, should have done. Mute your, number one, mute your, listen to uh, Dave. Audio so number we can... two, <laughs> that was the last time I ever did a deployment without flying a full 360 to look at. We underestimated the waves coming in on the left side dramatically. Those suckers were curled. I mean, they were little cute three foot Corpus Christi curls, but it was still a curl. And yeah. uh, I don't want to go too far into it, but it, it pushed me some places I didn't want to be. The weight of that decision. So, um, Kurt, I'm going to come to you because now you're not only a PIC of the aircraft, but uh, as far as aircraft commander, like you come on scene and what are you seeing from the left seat? Is this like, a, oh, shit, I'm sitting in the wrong seat? Or is this like, no, I, we, we got this. We can do this. Oh, yeah. You no, know, I pulled up and I knew it. I knew everybody's capabilities and I knew how well we could work together as a team. So there was never a there was never an area of doubt in my mind as to whether or not we could accomplish what we needed to accomplish. What was a doubt in my mind was what was going to be the safest way for everybody involved to do this. And when we flew up, I if if I remember correctly, we initially started talking about a deployment to the vessel itself because that is so standard Coast Guard stuff. Yeah. So we sat there and we evaluated the a, the hoist to the vessel itself and we talked about several different spots knowing that the rigging was out and the wave motion and all the factors all the variables that could be there and after we considered all of it and we basically took a vote with marty being involved as the person that's going to get down into it is like it might not be a good idea to put this person on the boat itself because of the fact that all the circumstances involved we've got an inexperienced uh, hoist operator we've got an inexperienced co-pilot We've got a lot of factors that we're going to have to make what wouldn't normally be adjustments to. We're going to make adjustments to this. Okay. And so it wasn't a doubting of anybody's abilities because I guarantee you that was not a big factor in the decision, but it was like, okay, this is going to be a very challenging hoist. And we've got two new guys and we've got one old guy sitting there that's very nervous about this shit right now. <laughs> he's yeah, not yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, like, uh... <laughs> so basically we, we talked about it and we said, and this, uh, again, I want to emphasize that this is primarily based on what we are seeing, not on anybody's uh, perceived level of ability to accomplish the fact, accomplish yeah. it. But we all have made a decision that for safety, it would be the easiest thing for us to put Marty down in the water and let him maneuver from there. And then we would just stay there and monitor the situation and make sure that everything was right. And okay. that came to be the, the idea that was accepted by all of us. And so we started moving towards a position to execute that decision. And I'll just go ahead and go into it. And we went, did the, all the rescue checks and everybody was in agreement on where we were gonna deploy and what was gonna happen then if we uh, put Marty in and he started swimming up towards the, uh, towards the vessel. And all of a sudden the water just sucked him to the back of it. And then sucked just exactly what Dave was saying about the hydraulics is the situation. It sucked <laughs> him right over into the, uh, onto the port side and right into the fucking nets. And, and Dave's Dave like, and I, I told you, I told you so. If you had We're just listened to me the first he's, freaking He's going time. under, he's going, I told you motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and going into that, yeah, we, we did, Kurt brought up a good point. Um, we, we discussed, we'll go right before we, we, we deployed Marty. I remember that discussion now. Yeah, my whole thing, we, we deployed to the stern of a shrimp boat and, 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 and put the rescue swim down there because of the outriggers up near the middle of the boat toward the middle to more front of the boat. We would, uh, we would deploy the swimmer to the, to the stern or the back end of the shrimp boat. But we thought, the, 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 the discussion in there was he'll get those people, he'll coax them to get into the water to him. Yeah. And then he would, we'd either, we'd either, we'd go with Marty after that, where he gave us a signal to either deploy the basket down and we'd hoist them. Or like I said, we weren't too far from the beach. He could take them to the beach. Cause by this time we knew that station South Padre was in route. 
and they weren't too far off. They were hauling, they, they had a truck with lights and sirens. They were hauling butt toward our position. So we were, and, and I'll back up, you asked Ernie, yeah, I forgot Ernie that Ernie and I were both the greenhorns on there. Yeah. <laughs> this, this was actually, this, this, I will say by far in my career, this was one of the hoists that I had to work the hardest and this was only the second time I'd involved in a SAR case of hoisting. The first time was on deployment in Miami, and I was sitting in the left seat. So this was my first SAR case where I was actually hoisting. On, ever. As, a, as a pilot yeah. in the right seat? As a pilot, as a pilot at the controls and yeah. in, the, in the right seat. This was my first SAR case. I had done hoisting before in training, yeah. but as far as a SAR case, this was my first SAR case that I was hoisting in. So we are. We're sitting there hovering. Ernie, you know, we go through at this part of the, for the people that will be listening that aren't familiar with the, the Coast Guard procedures, at this point, Kurt is our safety pilot. He's monitoring instruments, taking over the radio calls. Ernie, Ernie, it's pretty much turned over to the Ernie, Marty, and David show. And really what I am at this point is we came up with our plan. We're going to deploy Marty into the water on the, on the port side of the shrimp boat, the left side. And hopefully the waves and the, the seas would help him make his way to the to the shrimp boat. Um, at this point, I'm kind of a uh, as Kurt alluded to earlier. I had the monkey skills. I'm a monkey at the controls. I'm listening to what Ernie's telling me what to do as a flight mechanic. I'm in control of the helicopter, but he's directing me on where to put the helicopter. And then of course Marty's Marty's hanging on the hook, getting ready to deploy. Yeah. So uh, we uh, we maneuver around and uh, yeah we we get to the point where we put Marty down and uh, Mark just as Kurt alluded to the I had Ernie and I I think had the best sight of what went on at that point um, Marty hit the water he disconnected a wave came in and we didn't see Marty. The right, next wait, thing. Wait, don't go that far. Don't go that far. Because we're, we're going we're gonna to catch this from Marty here in a second. Uh, listen, Ernie, I, I got to come to you here. As a hoist operator, like, I, I get it. I know exactly what you're looking at. And you're you're sending your guy in down to, like, a little bit of an abyss. And waves are going crazy against the boat. Like, what is going through your head as you're conning in and, and dropping them in? Yeah, like I said, um, you know, we've all talked about it. we 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 briefed this thing up. We we talked a lot, quite a bit. We had we had talked. We knew exactly what we were going to do. We had the game plan. I knew exactly the spot where I had Marty. Uh, you know, I had the best view. I'm standing there in the door as a hoist oh, operator, yeah. like you said. We got the best Hands view. Down. I know what I'm looking at. You know what I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah, I see my spot. <clears throat> I'm confident in, in Dave. I know he's got the skills to do it. I've hoisted with him before in training, so. Yeah, maybe there was a little bit of arrogance on my point, which I just said, hey, I'm I'm going here. I'm going to put Marty here and, you know, he's he's going to work his way around it, and I'll pick him up on the other side. I don't think anything in my mind had told me what was going to happen next. I wasn't ready for that. I was, that was just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I was, I was fairly new. I was, I was fairly arrogant, to be completely honest. And I, I, yeah. I knew what I was going to do and I was confident in my skills. So I don't think going through my mind is I'm setting them down. Here we go. Let's do this thing. And, uh, you know, I'm taking signals from Marty. He's giving me those, those hand signals from down there. And I'm looking at the point and, and let's go. That's pretty much. So my he gets time. to the water. Ready, Marty? Marty gets to I'm the ready. water. I, I don't want to get my, <laughs> I don't get my pilots too excited. I'll stop and let you all fill in because there, <laughs> there's a, a mini plateau in this story. Okay. Uh, I hit the water. And it's apparent that the stern to the boat is gone, okay? It is so low in the water at the stern. The waves are coming straight up like a ramp, accelerating. They've already taken out the back wall of the pilot house. So the water's rolling into the pilot house and exploding out all the windows. What? And there's four people up there. So it's peeling the pilot house off the vessel and it's starting to cave the decks in because the water needs a place to go. There's just that much. It's getting swells coming in from the stern. It's getting tubes coming in from the left side, which I grossly underestimated. And you'll see why in a minute. And then what Ernie was saying about the downriggers out, their nets are in the water. So if these guys jump overboard, they're getting washed out and they're going into the nets. So they are no bueno stranded. And they don't know how to use the TEDS device. So what? <laughs> Just plug that one in there. Uh, what the hell is a TEDS device? <laughs> that was good. That was good. A turtle excluder 
device. I got plenty of experience with that as a boarding officer in my shipboard time. But uh, that would not help anybody on that boat to try to get out of those nets. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my so God. the team gets me where I'm supposed to be. And I look over and I, and I, I kind of recognize that, you know, okay, first, you know, change one. I can't get near that stern because the nets are just ballooned out around the, the stern underwater. And so I'm like, okay, plan B. I swim to the outrigger, which is dipped into the water. Yeah. And I play George of the Jungle and I start doing the monkey bar thing up yeah. until I realize, okay, I'm getting higher and higher out of the water to the point that. And he doesn't realize it, but I'm screaming at him at this point. <laughs> oh, he's screaming him down in the water. Yeah, because yeah, we can hear you. I just, <laughs> don't do that, you dumbass. Yeah. So, but <laughs> so uh, I'm doing hand over hand. Hand over hand up the outrigger, and I start realizing I'm going to come too high out of the water because the waves are dropping out behind, uh, below me. Okay. So now I'm just full gear going up the rigging, and I get to a point where I know I'm pretty close to the side of the boat, but it's probably about a good nine feet. Oh. And all I see oh. is this big old pulley, probably about 12, 14 inches around that they use to pick, drop the door, uh, the doors on the nets. Yeah. And I do my, my greatest move ever, my Indiana Jones throw off, grab it, ride it halfway around, pull my fingers out before I get buried, and then jump off for the boat. And all that grandiose is ended when I'm sucked, when I land to grab the side of the boat and I get stuck in the hole that the tubes created under the, uh, under the boat. That's where I thought he was dead. That's oh, good. my God. Yeah, and what... And what Marty, and what happened here from the helicopter is the rescue swimmers carry a handheld radio. Yep. And we have a pre-described frequency where we can talk to the rescue swimmer on the radio. He hit, when he went underwater, he hit the side of the vessel so hard it broke his radio. And for a while there, he was actually, it, it jammed in his transmit button. So... We're sitting there hovering, and we could hear Marty struggling underwater, basically drowning. So the helicopter was quiet. Um, I'm not going to lie. I've never said so many prayers sitting there hovering, waiting for Marty to come out over the water. Um, Marty and I have a history. I knew him when I was a high school senior, and I used to practice swimming to go to the academy, and he allowed my father, who was a police officer, and me to swim during the time that the rescue swimmers had the pool reserve at the Y in Corpus. Um, and so that was my first introduction to Marty. He actually gave me some swimming tips to help me because I was a pretty weak swimmer before going to the Coast Guard Academy. And so I've known Marty for, for several years now. And I knew his wife because uh, she worked at the Y. And uh, so all that's going in through my head right now. Here I got Marty. Even though Kurt was the aircraft commander, I'm out of the controls. I, Marty's dead. And uh, it was pretty quiet, and we could see some bubbles. I remember seeing bubbles, and that's what I started to do. And I know Kurt was yelling at me because the biggest thing in hovering a helicopter is you want to keep the nose of the helicopter into the wind. Yeah. Um, I started following the bubbles, and I was seeing bubbles, and the bubbles – and let me back up. The other thing we saw that was sticking out that Marty didn't mention was there was a, a, a piece of broken lumber, and it was a two-by-four – that had a jagged pointed edge that was sticking over the side of the shrimp boat. So Marty did pop up and he popped up right to the right side of this two by four with a point, And then he went back under. And um, all I could see was that two by four sticking out and thought Marty was going to get impaled on that. And so he went back under again. And luckily he shot to the left side of that two by four when he came back up. So from the helicopter, I don't know what, I'll let Ernie say what we saw after this. I just started following the bubbles going from about the, 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 the rear end, the stern of the shrimp boat on the left side amidships and then over toward the bow, the port bow of the shrimp boat. Um, and Kurt started yelling at me like a good safety pilot is because we were out of the wind line at this point. Yeah. And we were still in the Bravo helicopter, so we were we were very power limited at this point. So uh, that's that's I'll leave off right there. 
All right. I'll tell you what. I, the, hold on, Ernie. I'm going to come to you here in a second. I promise. I could. <laughs> Marty, what the yeah. what the heck's going on, dude? Like, you're, you just, <laughs> okay. you know, you know t- what the heck? What are you stuck on? So, so I, I get slammed in this little cave, this little cavern halfway under the hole. And, uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I got, I got to get out of here. And I, uh, I jump up and I try and grab the edge of the boat and I can't find it. And something slapped the top of my mask. You know, I get a little bit of air, but then the next wave comes in and zoop shoves me back in the cave. And, uh, I come up again and before I can get, you know, a handhold zoop shoves me back in the cave again. And the third time, you know, yeah, I, I think at that point I had a fishbowl. I had to clear my mask. And I, I come up the third time. And, uh, oh, the second time it, when it hit my mask, it cut me. It cut a piece of my brow. And uh, so I come up the third time and I'm looking, you know, my mask is down around my neck and I'm looking right at the point. It's literally like, you know, a half inch from my Holy eyeball. Shit. I couldn't see it. So I, I get down, I get, I get good air. I get sucked under again. I clear the mask and I'm like, okay, this ain't working. And I look up and I see the helicopter and I see the direction that they're pointing, which is against the waves. And I realize, yep, you're on your own. They can't float anything in the wave direction. The wind direction aren't cooperating. You got to figure something out or make your peace with God right here. And, uh, and it's funny because I can see the helicopter clearly, but I'm looking through the rigging and the oh wires God, and all that. Dude. And I'm okay. like, okay, this, this is a sucks donut right here. Sucks donut. And uh, <laughs> all of a sudden I remember, okay, egress. And I, I, I did a half jump, got a good hold of the side, and I hand over hand going up, going over all the way around the edge of the boat until I was hanging uh, from my hands. And then that's when I, I knew, okay, the bow, if I'm out of the water, then the bow is steady. And I let go. And then I literally just walked around the boat. Like walked, yeah, like literally walk. walked around the boat. Yeah. On the yeah. beach. Yeah. The, okay. nose, the, the you, nose was high, like maybe two, three feet. Of I got to ask, I gotta ask Marty a question because I've never asked him this question before. I'm doing all this. And I'm going to sit there and say, Marty, at what point in time did you think I'm dead? I'm not making it out of this situation and these guys are going to be doing a fucking body search for me. When I looked up and I saw the aircraft pointed opposite of the sea direction and I knew they can't float anything in. I mean, you, you look at, uh, I think it was Tristan Heaton that had yeah. the, uh, the, the, the cave. cave rescue. Yeah. Where they floated everything in. Yeah. I was like, well, that's our one stupid human trick and that ain't going to work here. So if I don't get myself out, they're going to find me in this hole tomorrow. Wow. Ernie, what do you think? All right. Yeah, Ernie, I gotta come to Ernie. So you're yeah, you're yeah, now, so. you put the you put you know Marty down in the water and you see him get like crawling all over the boat and you're like, what the hell is he doing? And then poof, he disappears in doing some Indiana Jones stuff. What yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm watching Marty crawl <laughs> uh, crawl across this this thing, and I'm hearing Kurt, and Kurt's just yelling. <laughs> are you doing <laughs> in Kurt voice over there but then I'm and I'm not even hearing him on ICS because I don't think he was keyed up I'm hearing him over the sound I wasn't, of the helicopter. I wasn't even on hot mic man I was just <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't on hot mic he's just I could hear him through the through the helicopter what the fuck are you doing <laughs> <laughs> oh so my god there's a bit of a chuckle and it and and then when, when Marty went under it was done it was like okay the, the chuckle went away and 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 I remember vividly seeing marty look up so that's the memory that sticks in my mind every time he would come up out of that water and mind you like you said i, I think uh, that kind of got lost we're listening to this we're hearing everything that's going on at this point because his radio is shorted out so we can hear him struggle we can hear the water we can hear the, the waves crashing against him we can hear him get pushed in that hole and, and hit the side of the boat so every time he's he's looking up you know and he pops out of the water he's looking up at us and and he, he He's right, you know. He as we were drifting, he's still looking at us, drift away from. Him. So that's the memory that sticks in my mind. I paid out hoist cable, and I don't know if it was muscle memory or if it was just oh shit, and I froze in that moment. But I had the hoist cable, the hoist stick in my hand, 
and had a huge loop. And I said, if, if he just sticks his hand up, I can probably throw this in his hand and get him out. You know, that's Holy what was going through my mind. Like, let's, that's the only way that we're going to get him out of this is if, if you know, <laughs> like I said, and I was ready. It was, it was, but the opportunity just was not there. The rigging was everywhere. It just was not going to happen. Holy smoke. So we're basically sitting in there in a hover and we're watching Marty, hearing Marty, and we are feeling Marty struggle because, you know, as a crew, when you're engaged in something like that, you are, you almost become one. And so we're, we're feeling the things that Marty's going through and we're looking for solutions to try to help it. And we are coming up with nothing, absolutely nothing. All we can do is wait for Marty to get away from that boat. And he is completely on his own to have to do that. Yeah. And, and to say that as we followed Marty, you know, he was hand over hand and, and yes, for an explanation, he was standing because the shrimp boat ran aground on a sandbar. Yeah. So he was able to stand in the water, but we still didn't want to get at that point. We didn't want to get close to the boat. So after the hand over hand, what I remember is he started swimming out and then we came back into a hover toward the original point when we came on scene you know, at the point of the V of where I was seeing the currents converging together uh, on the port side. And at that point, um, I don't know if Marty gave the emergency pickup signal. We knew we were picking them up. So uh, I don't know I, if Ernie just sent the hook down or not. I think we said, let's pick them up, calm me in. And uh, Ernie took over. And I'm going to say this, put the plug in for Ernie, because uh, I'm not going to lie. I've never sold this to anybody. But after that case, my arms were so damn sore because I was such a green pilot. I didn't, I didn't have it down the relaxed forearms or relaxed hands. I mean, when I became a more seasoned pilot, in fact, this is a whole other story, but Kurt showed me this trick of flying with three fingers on the stick to keep your arm relaxed. I was so green and knew that my forearms and shoulders were sore for two or three days because of the grip I had on the controls. And I think the, I might have, yeah, we got, we got done what we needed done. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying I was stressed to the max. And what got me through it was Kurt kept saying, you got this. And it was Ernie's voice. Uh, Cause like I said, I'm a monkey at the controls. And at a time where stress was at the max for all of us, um, Ernie kept, I remember Ernie's voice. It was a calm voice that I remember calling me in and getting me to get the helicopter where we needed to go to get Marty picked up. And that's what we did us, I think, as a crew when we went to pick Marty up on this first time after he got himself safely away from the boat. It, it, you know, the, the biggest thing is we were all probably praying or doing whatever. We were all in shock and stress levels were high. Um, Marty was safe. He was now floating in the water. And what regaged us or regaged me was Ernie. His voice was calm. And I remember saying, let's pick him up. I don't, you know, I don't even think, I think we went a little off standard procedures. I don't think we even went through rescue checks, but we were already ready. Rescue checks were already completed. I just said, calm me in. And uh, Ernie's voice calmed me right in. I don't know if he put the sling down or just the hook or what. Ernie can talk about that, but we were now regaged, calmed down, back ready to pick Marty up and get him into the helicopter. And, and like I said, uh, props to Ernie because I do remember on that case, his voice keeping me calm. Nice, Ernie, well done. Uh, hold on, Ernie, I'm gonna come back to you, you one good, second. Brother. <laughs> Marty, I gotta come back to you for a second. Brother, you get like, pull yourself out of hell, like literally survive. And, and come to the front of the boat and, and you're now standing up, which is blowing my mind right now because again, everybody should have listened to Dave. Strong, I got you, Dave. All right, I got you. All right. But uh, are, are you given a ready for pickup? Is it, is it like, okay, just get me out of here and let's reset this or what's going through your mind real quick. And then I'm going to come to Ernie. I'm, I'm like the hard parts over hard parts over. It's like just granted the, uh, the starboard side was a different set of hazards. It, it went from maybe two feet of water to whatever the waves were coming in. And the boat sheltered the waves a little bit on that side. I seem to remember like about maybe six footers. Okay. Uh, but man, it was a riptide. 
on that side. So the water was tubing in, swelling in from the back, looping around the bow, and then yeah. shooting straight out to sea down the starboard side. Holy and smoke. it was like, you know, you're standing there. And it's like a fire hose at your ankles. Yeah. Uh, Dang. So I'll be honest. If you guys pick me up after that, I don't remember. <laughs> but probably, All right. In that case, yeah, let's come I'll, to Ernie. <laughs> Ernie, yeah. you got you got Marty at the at the other side of the vessel now, the, standing up like everybody's. Yeah, obviously once once he's I, we see him stand up, we you just exhale, you know, and yeah. you just you just exhale, um, you know, uh, yeah. At that point, you know, my brain kind of recaged. Okay, let's get him out of the water. He's yeah. safe. Let's let's get him out and. And like Dave said, he's like, let's, I think he, he even said, let's get him out. Something to that. We, we went totally off script. We, did, we, we didn't go standard on this. He's like, let's get him out. Marty's on his back, just kind of kicking. Like, like he's swimming on a, on a Sunday, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't yeah. have known he was 10 seconds away yeah. from death just before this. Holy and he looks, he looks up at me. And like I said, I had this big loop of hoist cable in my hand. Had the hook in my hand. Dave, when, when Dave said, we need, uh, let's go ahead and get him, that kind of caged me and went back into, okay, back into rescue mode. Let's, let's get Marty out. I already had this huge thing, a cable, this, uh, you know, and the hook, and I just kind of just dropped it and let it slide through my hands and just put it basically right in front of him to where he, all he had to do was grab it. Wow. Dang. All right. So now, whew, we get Marty back in the aircraft. You guys are yes, together. Yeah, now we got to do work. <laughs> All right. I'm going to put a pause on you guys for a second, and we're going to go to Dempsey. Dempsey! Yo! What are you doing? with? They're, they're on scene getting their butt kicked. Uh, Marty's almost yeah. dying. Um, you, you got a full crew. You got you got law enforcement coming in from every direction. What, what are you guys coming in? To, what are you preparing? I, I didn't respond to it uh, on scene. I was actually at the command center at that point, the old ops center and directing uh, station South Padre Island to go up there, uh, had them start contacting Border Patrol and then uh, a couple of other agencies, including CGIS, who ended up taking this case and uh, don't really remember what the actual, uh, I don't know what the results were of this case. Does anybody remember what the results were of this one? That's okay. I was hoping I was hoping you had that because I have no clue. Yeah, and, and at this point we got Marty in the helicopter and the land units show up on the beach. They're on the beach. You guys are starting to see them approach from every direction and they're bringing it. Well, at, at that point it was just stationed South Hot. There's one Coast Guard vehicle with a crew of four or five people on the beach. Okay. You know, um, and that's that's where we're at. When we see the, that was that was a pretty long drive up. down the beach without any any paved road because yeah. going all the way up and, just short of short of man. We see these guys, guys pulling up. Go ahead, Kurt. When we see these guys pulling up, I remember very distinctly the thought in my mind is this case is over with, okay? Because I'm not putting anybody else at risk when we've got all these guys coming up on the beach. Yeah, and that proved out to not not be the case because of the fact that now we were going to, and we'll go into this, we've got Marty back in the aircraft. I've got finished with my screaming at him. And he said, no, oh, I'm sorry, dad. I didn't mean to do that. And uh, so now we're, we're looking at redeployment. Okay. All right, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I, I got to back up. I got to back up one sec. So you got Marty okay, in the sorry. aircraft. You've yelled at him. What are you doing? I can totally see this. Why? Because I've I been did. in that. Oh, yeah, room. I sit there. And I, I like to actually take my, my, I've got my helmet on and I take my microphone and I get it away from my face so that I'm not screaming on ICS. And I'm, Dave's over there, he's just flying the aircraft and I'm turned almost completely around, almost, almost facing the back going, the fuck's wrong with you? I, 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 you almost died. You're going to make, you know how make, bad you're going to make me look if you fucking die while I'm the aircraft commander? Do you realize how much paperwork yeah, this is? Be, Marty! You I got to remember, he's just been through a, He's just been through a life-threatening maneuver, and he's fucking tired of shit. He's just like, "Okay, Dad, sorry." <laughs> oh my goodness! All right. So, and as a recap, we still have four people that are stuck on the vessel, and you guys are now in the aircraft. 
regrouping. We've got Marty back in yes. the trap, and now we're sitting there going, what are we going to do now? We've got people on the beach, We've got, and we're sitting there going, I wish these fuckers would just jump off the boat and swim to the beach, and we could be done. But we all know that that's not going to happen that way. Yeah. Yeah, we, we got in, and I'll be honest, from that point, after Kurt got, got done yelling, um, and Marty, Marty somehow got back on ICS. He got his helmet back on and got back on ICS. And I remember all of us calming down. We're hovering there. And Kurt said, okay, Marty, are you okay? And he said, I'm okay. And we started talking. He goes, Marty said, we still have lives to save. Oh, and man. so we got, we got back into rescue mode. And to be honest, at that point, if this is the crew resource management and how respectful things are within the crew. Um, at that point, I said, I, I, you know, yeah, I got overruled the first time, but this next time I remember being a little more assertive, which I wasn't the first time. I said, we need to put him down right over here and get him to coax the people into the water. And we had South Padre Island on the beach. I said, Marty can swim them in or we'll send the basket down. And that's when we all regaged and we all came on board with that plan to do that. And um, we gave Marty a few minutes and he uh, got back in the door. He took his helmet off. He got ready and he patted me on the shoulder. And, uh, and he said, and I'll remember that because I'm a brand new dude. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie, man. I about crap my pants on this case. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm, I'm going to say that that's how green I was. I've never seen this before. You see this shit in movies, you know? Um, so we all got back into rescue mode and we got back on our standard commands. It was rescue checklist part two for a harness deployment of the rescue swimmer to the water. And bam, we got into it. And, uh, from then on, I'll, I don't know, I'll let whoever take over, but we got to the point where we were deploying Marty to the water. He was going to make the call. Um, once he got in the water, where, whether he wanted the basket or he was going to escort the people to the shore to Station South Padre. And at that point, I'll throw this in, we could see the people. We were hovering low enough and close enough that we could see a young girl, teenager more than likely. We could see an old man, I want to say 70s to 80s, very frail, uh, skinny old man. And then we could see two middle-aged men. One was very heavy set, and the other was middle build, uh, probably 5'10". The, the fat guy, I'll just say fat guy, was uh, um, uh, shorter, but I remember a uh, not average height, middle, middle built male. So you had three males and one young girl. And we knew we had to get into that. So whoever can go from there, uh, we got to the point where we were ready to deploy Marty the second time. Well, I'll tell you what, let me let me bring it to Marty because you're you get to go ahead, like a, a nice tap on the shoulder for your co pilot. It's oh you sorry, your the guy flying, guy at the controls. It's really nice of you, by the way. <laughs> uh so now you're Before you're Marty going deploys. Yeah, go ahead. Before Marty deploys, part of the discussion after we decided we're we've have, we've actually moved from the the port the port side of the boat now back around the bow to the to the uh, starboard side of the boat to our original deployment point. So we're back now at our original deployment point because no matter how you slice this thing, that's still the best deployment point for us to maintain visual on everything that's going on. It's just now we've come to the understanding that Marty can't get close to the boat. Yeah. That's still our position. Our original position is still the best position, but we've just learned something that now we're taking, that Marty's taken back down into the water with him. And cause now he knows what the currents are and he knows he just can't get too close to that boat. And our only option is to get those people off the boat, which now, now the plan is focusing on getting those people into the water. And we're, we're sitting there looking at who, who it is we know we've got two non-swimmers the girl and the old man and we yeah. don't know about the other guys yet and that's what marty's fixing to find out <laughs> all right come on marty you you get deployed you got ernie kicking you so down we, we, right uh, same spot yeah we we get deployed and uh like ernie said remember the outriggers are out and one is in the water port side left side's in the water 
So the right side's a little elevated. And uh, Dave starts scooching in for this hoist. And uh, we really like approaching stuff with that boat out at one o'clock. And so Dave has to do an absolute backward ass hoist. He's putting the cabin side, the right side of the aircraft, up against the right side of the, the vessel, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but it kind of is, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so he's sliding directly right with me under the helicopter. And I look up and the, uh, the cable might be a foot from the outrigger. And the oh, outrigger sick. is exactly where I need to go. And so he held that foot, you know, Ernie's telling him what to do and he's doing it. And we held that one foot of positive separation from the tip of that outrigger all the way to the boat. They simply put me down in the water. Uh, like I said, maybe two to three feet of fire hose that you're, you're just bracing to stand in and uh, disconnect and carefully. It's, you know, a lot of times we disconnect, and just throw that sucker to get it away from us. Yeah. And it was the most controlled recovery of a bear hook I've ever seen <laughs> because it was, well done, it was Ernie. that close to the rigging. We just yeah. didn't want to foul it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we, definitely not. I, I yell up, you know, I, I yell up and say, Hey, listen, I need two of you in the water right now. And uh, they produced this big, uh, it's called the Jim Bowie float, which you see strapped to the, the side of the, the shrimp boats. It's about a three foot by four foot rectangular piece of foam with nets all in it. And okay. the idea is you get in the middle of this thing and you can put three or four people floating in there and the net keeps them from falling out the bottom. Well, this particular one had a piece of plyboard sewn into the middle of it so they could sit up on top of it. And uh, it's, it's the waves are coming in too much to put anyone on top of it. So uh, the smaller fisherman comes down, helps me stabilize it. And he yells at the little girl and tells her, you know, pretty bluntly, get down here and get on this thing or, or get a hold of it. And uh, so we've got to turn sideways, which kind of makes my job hard pulling it. But the fisherman is all nice and spread out, grabbing the middle of the float Just and the very corner. Yeah. And uh, he's helping stabilize it. And the little girl comes down and she grabs the corner and we kind of get this idea. Okay. I'm just going to drag you just hold on to this. It's going to keep your head above water. You're going to be safe. Yeah. I'm going to drag you against this riptide up to the beach where the guys are. And I noticed that the little girl, she, her hands are touching as she holds on to this thing. And she's kind of in a modified fetal position as I start to drag her. And she's rolling away from the fisherman. The fisherman's all spread out grabbing and he's shooting her looks of hate. Now, my experience is when people are in trouble, they're like puppies. They like to cuddle up. They like to huddle. Yeah. They like to stay warm. Uh, this little girl couldn't get any further away from this guy. And this is when I figure out he's a smuggler and she's the cargo. Holy smoke. So we start dragging him out. And I reach over and I pat her hand and I let her know, I know. And then I kind of look at him and give him the angry eyes through the mask. Like, don't you give me an ounce of trouble. <laughs> and we, we pull them out and it's it's a struggle i'm not thinking you know I'm, I'm trying to go sideways to get through the the rip but i'm i'm not giving it enough rudder and we're getting still getting sucked towards the boat and so i wind up swimming directly against this riptide for i don't know probably not that far 15 20 yards yeah and we get them up to the beach and uh by then the uh the rescue party's there rescue boarding party uh, they picked me up with a hoist and I just grabbed the rope, uh, that went to the Jim buoy and they picked me up like that. So I got the Jim buoy dangling below me about maybe six, eight feet and helicopter put me right back on the, uh, on the, on that, uh, sandbar in the middle of the rip right next to the boat. So we did that, that same close proximity hoist, same approach right up the downrigger again. So and, you uh, took the float that was, that was had the first two victims on it, picked yeah. it up when you got picked up uh, off the beach and brought over to the ship yes. and put down next to the ship. Correct. Holy That's shit. correct. Marty. So, uh, okay, so Ernie, well obviously, done. Dude. Obviously here, obviously <laughs> here, standard Coast Guard rescue procedure has now been preempted a little bit and we are improvising 
but we are still maintaining uh, through communication safety. all the safety issues that we need to watch. We're watching right. all right. the personnel issues, all the engine issues, yeah. all the all the aircraft issues. We are watching everything, and I think we're all very cognizant of the fact that we are departing from standard procedure, and it requires a little bit more caution on our part. Mm -hmm. And we were doing that. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, uh, and I'm on so board with all of that. By the way, real quick, like, like standard procedures, and you have to be able to deviate because there's no SAR case that's ever been the same, and there's no yeah. SAR case I've ever been that's been on the same, and. You have to be able to adapt and overcome the situation you're in. If that's what you've got to be able to pick up and get right back next to the, the ship, man, solid. Yeah, working. Kurt's it. always done some solid hoist work because what that other case that me and Marty and Kurt were on, whenever I was a break in Coxon up in Port O'Connor, uh, Kurt said, "Well, you guys are too far away to get the tow line to him. Let me drop the hook." So we took the hook from the helo, tied it to the tow line from the 41, and had Kurt and him pass the tow line to him. Hey, whatever works. I'm just saying. <laughs> and, uh, well, figure but, that shit out, man. Yeah. yeah. And they were, for some reason, uh, the, the, uh, the wife was injured pretty bad, and the husband was just hanging on, so they couldn't actually tie the boat up, so they had to drop, drop the tow and... Marty got to go play a little bit more on that one. Jesus, there's a whole other case. We're going to get it. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another one. Right. You guys, holy yeah. smoke. Just all of you guys together. Yeah. You're like a, the bandits. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a perfect storm whenever right? all of us were on duty. Something right. was going to go smoke. down. Something was going down. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, so, it, we're, so they we're get into the, Yep. Go ahead. Okay. So I've got this thing dangling maybe a couple of feet below my legs. I can drop the line if I need to. Uh, they, they're pulling me over. They drop me off in exactly the right place. Same deal. We set it up. Uh, big guy. He gets in. The first guy was about my size, maybe 5'9", five, 5'10", five, five, you know, 220. Uh, the next guy's notably bigger. He's probably 5'11", to six foot even. And he's probably got me by what earned about 60 pounds. I oh, see. He's a big fucker. <laughs> that's, that's about all I can say. He was a big fucker. I was like, Oh God, this is yeah. a big guy. <laughs> yeah. So he's, uh, I'm, I'm giving up 280 conservatively. Yeah. And yeah, uh, he's studying it. Yeah. He's studying the, the raft. And this time the grandfather is small and frail enough. He can actually get on that raft. And even with the waves, he is not falling off. And he's clutching a, a plastic bag that I never knew what was in the bag. And I'm hoping Dempsey will tell me at some point, but he's clutching this plastic bag like his life depends on it because it probably does. And uh, so this time I'm going to get smarter. I'm taking the long way around the, bar the barn. I know this is the last uh, evolution. So I just swim straight down the beach across the riptide like we tell the civilians to do. And uh, lo and behold, I see uh, the basket about six inches off the water. Why did we put the basket down? Anybody? I, 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 yeah, at this, at this point, I don't know if Mario remembers, but at this point, the man stayed with the raft. The, the big dude was also clutching a black trash bag. And um, so you took the old man in the raft back to the beach, Marty. And then... I, I think we did another hoist to bring you back to the big dude in the water. We put you back with that dude and we saw you struggling with that guy and Ernie rigged the basket to try to put the basket down in case you needed it. Something to that effect. Ernie may have more, but that's, that's what I, there was, we did three total evolutions with you that second round and and you didn't have the old man with you on that last one. So it was just you and what was ended up being the master of the shrimping vessel, the, the captain was the last guy and he was the biggest dude. Wow. Yeah, I don't remember I don't remember you swimming out either, no, just no. because of the fact that we were trying to conserve your energy and use the uh, air helicopter to move right. you back and forth. Right. I, I remember all this totally different. And when I tell you the story, I think you may agree with me. 
<laughs> we're we're going towards the basket. We're going towards the direction of the basket, not towards the basket. Basket. At this point, I know he's a smuggler. I know he's a bad dude. When I see the basket, all I can think of is the knife bolted to the wall right next to the door. And I'm like, I cannot let this guy get in our helicopter. Yeah. And I don't know what Mike knows at this point. And we didn't, we weren't really yeah. acoustic so, about that. Yeah. So we still didn't know. Yeah. We well, well I, I will say this it's coming back. The guy was away from the raft. And so why we put the basket in there is because you no longer had the raft. We were expecting to, what we had talked about in the helicopter was you using, putting the last guy in the basket and us taking the basket back to the beach. We had no intent of bringing anybody into the helicopter except you, Marty, after it was all done. So that you were separated from the raft. That's why we put the basket. Yeah, we didn't know anything. Yeah, but you don't, when you don't have the radio, because your radio is broken, there's no communication there. Oh, jeez, yeah. oh, man. Marty did that intentionally. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, Way so to go, Marty. Go. Don't you know that's yeah, government property? Fault. Yeah. Yeah. So we take a wave, and that Jim Bowie stands almost on end. It almost flips over on top of me with the old man and the big guy still holding on. And he gets up high enough to see that boarding party, and he decides he don't want to go to the beach anymore. <laughs> so it lays flat. And he does that that cartoon cat, car, you know, look at me like he looks at the basket. He looks at me. He looks at the basket. And then he does that ready, set, go posture where you see him crouch down with the shoulders coming up. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, oh, please, God, don't go for it. Yep, he's going for it. He's swimming for the basket. And uh, this this is the part of the show that the pilots always miss because they're too busy trying to stay in the air. But I'm sure Ernie <laughs> got the full view on this. He gets to the basket. I'm thinking the old man is good to go. He's floating on in a life preserver. Yeah. Still holding the bag. And I go after this guy and he gets to the basket and he's standing on the second sandbar and at the trough is just maybe two, three feet of water. But when the wave comes in, an extra six feet changes the story. So he grabs the basket, shoves it down on the ground, puts his foot in it. A wave hits him. He falls backwards and he starts trying to grab the basket and climb it like, and it's spinning. And oh so it looks like he's God. trying to climb the spinning log. Ernie's paying out cable and this idiot reaches through the middle to, to really seize that basket and puts himself in the middle of three turns of cable. Holy <laughs> so, smoke. So he's wadded up. I get there. I literally, I, he, he's not wearing a shirt. He's wearing jeans. The water temps, maybe 50 degrees. And he's not even affected by it. It's not care. He just wants out of here. Uh, I went over, shoved everything off his shoulders, uh, got him in a cross chest, dis cross chest, disentangled him. And then I did the, another mistake. I used my fin to push the basket away. And when you lay down on that surface of the water, you know that's not a fighting stance. You right. can't maneuver anymore. That's right. your last move. He rolled over on top of me and grabbed me under my arms and then around over my shoulders. And the next thing I saw was, was man nipple and underarm hairs in my mask and him bending over trying to drown me on the sandbar. Holy shit. So I'm tired enough to be relaxed. Uh, he doesn't understand that thing poking him in his jaw is my snorkel. I can still breathe. But... I'm trying to figure out, this is great. I can't stand up because I got fins on and he's taller than me anyway. And uh, I notice every time a wave comes in, his arms go up to stabilize himself. And so about the second or third wave, which tells you how long I was underwater, I just stuck my thumb right between his ribs hard as I could. I, I looked for a pressure point under his arm. Yeah. When he exposed it, I hit him as hard as I could. I actually thought I broke my thumb, but I know I spread his ribs apart and, you know, tickling his heart made him recoil. And uh, I went under his arm, came up on his back, popped him in his lower back to bend him backwards over the top of me to get yeah. him into a, uh, a cross chest, controlled cross chest. He rolls around and starts uh, swimming with me like I'm nothing. And he's going for the basket. And uh, he gets to the basket. And then it was my turn. I reached under the, his arms, 
I grabbed the basket and I bounced it off his head three times. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it's and, true. And, and, and I will confirm that because at this point, Ernie, Ernie pulled up enough cable that Marty was sitting at the one, two o'clock at the helicopter. So Ernie and I had a clear view of all of this. And all you saw was the guy at Marty's chest, the basket behind the guy, and Marty grabbed the basket and just thrust it into him like this three times. And the guy went limp. The guy went limp at that point. Yeah, that's, on, that's exactly what I saw. So Marty, <laughs> you're, you're, that, you're a, little, you're a little, little foggy. So what happened was what happened the old man was gone. So this, yeah, this evolution, the old man was gone. He was already done. We were, we were working on this, this getting this big dude off, the big fucker. That's yeah. what we'll call him. The big fucker had to come off, but he did not want off that boat. So that's where the basket came from because we, at this point, oh, we're in a Bravo. We're low fuel. I mean, it's a 65. We're always low on fuel. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, we, we take off. We're low on fuel. Yeah. So Marty's, Marty's in the water trying to get the big dude to come in. And that's what happened. The guy was not coming in. He was not getting off that fucking boat. And then somehow Marty either either grabbed him and pulled him in or he did coax him into the water. And that's when the fight started. But that's where the basket came from. It was like, hey, we got to get this guy. Got We got to get out of here. Like, we're, we're low on fuel. This is we've been here long enough. And uh, yeah, the fight and the basket hitting the guy in the head. That that was that was the, the definitely 100 percent true. I mean, I can totally had, see all off. you guys. <laughs> I, I can see all you in the air. Go, Marty, go. go, Marty, go. <laughs> I think there was even. I think there was even a, a holy shit, he's hitting him kind of moment. You know, <laughs> all, but, all except for me, I'm sitting. Over, I'm sitting over there going, Roger that. All niggers are good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Snodgrass couldn't see the show, but I think Dave had a great view of the show going on underneath us. Oh my God! So, and and then what we we ended up doing once the guy went limp from there, Ernie and I were talking, and we basically I think Marty looked up and gave a nod toward the beach, and we drug Marty, the guy with him pinned between Marty and the basket. We drug them to the beach and uh, uh, through the water to the beach. And at that point, it was, I don't know. If, Dave, I don't know if Marty got back. What do you mean? Dave, how did that discussion go when we decided to drag them to the beach instead of a, a, a normal hoist? Well, I think it was because of the fighting and the dude was immobilized between Marty and the basket. And we just. Already, yeah, the guy was done. It was like, okay, he's done. But what, I'm saying, what I'm saying is. <laughs> What I'm saying is we obviously, and I don't remember it, but we obviously had to have a, a quick, short discussion about that. And we came to a quick conclu conclusion that that was the best way. And I don't remember it. If somebody remembers oh, okay. that yeah, discussion. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this one. So, yeah. So after Marty renders the man unconscious, the big fucker, um, <laughs> he, he still has him in his bear hug. That's, I, I just thought to call him the big fucker because he was oh big. Oh, my God. But uh, – after he, he's got him, and he still has him pinched between the basket and himself. So there wasn't much that we could do, and Marty wasn't going to get this guy in the basket. I mean, he was he was a sack of potatoes at this point, and it was a big sack of potatoes. So he wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> so Marty did. He looked up, and he gave me a nod, and I've worked with Marty enough to know that's that's the ready for pickup. So the awesome. conversation was had. It's like, hey, you know, Dave, let's <laughs> – we're going we're gonna to go from here because this is all we got. And Dave's like, Roger that. Call me in, you know, and it was like, okay – Pulled in the slack and then just conned him back and conned him back to where Marty could stand. And then Marty took over from there. Yeah, Marty, go ahead. But wait, there's more. But <laughs> what really happened? <laughs> uh, so here's the deal. I'm, I'm, uh, I've got this guy. And I swear it's going through my head. I'm, I'm like, you know what? I'm a lifesaver and all that. And it's like, if there was ever anybody I could get away with killing, it's this guy right here. You know? I'm just, I'm pissed. All right. I looked into the eyes of this little girl and her grandfather that he's going to sell. They, they no telling them what they sold to get them on that boat so they could come and have a better life here and looked into her eyes and you know what it is. We, you, you get challenged physically and you tap into that rage to save your own life. But sometimes coming off that rage is a little bit hard. And so we get in a fight and now you feel justified in that rage. And you, you control the situation and you got to get rid of that rage and you got to go back to, hey, what's the job, right? So I've, I've got him pinned between the basket 
and all that flashes through my head. And meanwhile, we're floating out a little bit. Yeah, we're, go we're going out past the second sandbar a little bit, you know, probably somewhere around the third. And I just lock him in and uh, he's in a fetal position holding on to one bale, you know, and uh, yeah. I just lock him in. Ernie reads me, asks Dave to fly in. They fly in and we're going. And brother, my, my arms are shaking probably about as much as Dave's are. And I'm spent. <laughs> and all of a sudden I feel thump, thump, like we went over a speed bump. And I went, hey, wait a minute. That's a second sandbar. We're probably not, but maybe two, three feet of water now. And I managed to climb up the bales just a little bit to get a better view. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we're safe. And I let go. The basket turns on its side, digs into the first sandbar while they're still flying towards the beach. And it, it pulls that cable like a rubber band and lets go. And that dude went flying. There's probably <laughs> six foot circular coils shooting up into the helicopter. Ernie grabs the cable at the hoist and milks it down. I thought he's going to fall out of the helicopter. He's almost flat with the deck and stops the coils from going up into the rotors and gets control of that. And when I turn around to look at the guy, he's still doing cartwheels through the air. He does like two, three cartwheels <laughs> oh and lands on his butt looking like Bill the Cat. He's sitting there, you know, his legs are spread, his arms are between his legs and he's bleeding out his forehead. And the, the guy that arrests him is like, I'm not getting wet. He's got his gun drawn. And he's like, come here. <laughs> like, I'm not even going to get my shoes wet for you. And that was the last wow. thing I saw. And then uh, they came and they picked me up. Oh, oh wait a minute. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't remember if I got the old dude or if somebody else did or if he floated in. I don't know. I think by, I don't this, time, even remember. by this time in all of our minds, the mission is pretty much over. The adrenaline is starting to wear out, and we're looking at the fuel gauge saying, we got to get the fuck out of here. Let's wrap this thing up. we got to get out. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was, yeah. It was, yeah, we were, we were ready. We were yeah. Ready. We, were, we were at Bevo, and uh, we were, uh, yeah, we, we got Marty up, and it was kind of quiet, if I remember, on the way home. Uh, I think we were, we were all relieved. Um, we got home. We, we got back, and... Uh, uh, this this is what I don't remember much, um, and I don't know if Kurt can share more insight. If, if this, this is a forum forward, or because we haven't talked about this in years, but I do remember we had to go. We talked to the ops boss, and we talked to the captain. But then I was asked to be excused after that, and so I don't know. That's all my knowledge on this case. Uh, I know it turned into law enforcement after that. Um, and that's all we ever heard of, of that. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's it. You know, I know I was obviously excited about this case. I thought it was amazing, but because I guess it turned law enforcement, it was hush hush after this, yeah. uh, for us. And, um, uh, I don't know what all, I, I think there was a few causes of it, but I don't know. Um, but. I, I'm going to be honest, I thought this was award-winning SAR case uh, for this, and being a brand new green pilot, and, you know, I, I was like, dude, when are we going to get our medals? This is, this is amazing, and there was, uh, there was really um, nothing that happened there, and, 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 and Kurt, I'm going to say this, it's not you, because usually on SAR cases, the, the aircraft commander and the co-pilot work together and we write up awards for the crew and everything. Yeah. And um, uh, that's something that Kurt and I never did. And uh, I, I uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's just strange. I, I, I never have been able to grasp my, uh, uh, get a grasp of that. And I guess it's more the law enforcement stuff as well, because yeah, I know we almost lost Marty. Uh, that wasn't, something we did wrong that there wasn't a right or wrong way to approach this case uh you know even as i gained more experience throughout my career and 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 uh we did i i'm i'm gonna say we did everything procedurally discussion crew resource management everything the way we were supposed to do it and i don't know if another crew behind us would have been able to do the exact same things that we did uh, or we're probably gone through the same roads that we did and faced all the challenges um, 
you know, that this case was a, a case where four guys, different experience levels, we all worked our butts off that morning. And okay. it was, it was, it was, like I said, my right. hardest SAR case I've ever worked. And uh, it, 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 that's all, yeah, I could go on and on, but that's, that's what I'll say. It, I don't, from this point on, I don't know what happened, but it went very quiet afterwards. And I'll leave it at that. Wow. Uh, I, I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna, I will say that. Go uh, ahead, Kurt. I, I don't know exactly what happened afterwards either, but it's, it's funny because when you, when you look at this from a perspective point of view, okay, uh, Dave and Ernie, this was their first SAR case. Uh, it was very traumatic, very, very, very adrenaline inducing for them. For Marty, obviously, very adrenaline inducing. For me, yeah. I'm sitting over there on the other side, and I'll and when Dave's talking about the awards and all that kind of stuff, I had just come from six years of being an aircraft commander in Houston. I've probably flown, you know, a hundred SAR cases, nights, low visibility. I've I've been out in uh, hurricane force winds and thirty foot seas and pulling people off the of shrimp boats forty five miles out in just low ceilings, low visibility, driving rain, all that kind of shit. Yep. And I, I, I'm not trying to say anything derog uh, derogative here, but this was a really fucking simple case. Okay. <laughs> At, until, except for when Marty was under the boat, everything <laughs> about this case was super fucking simple. Okay. Yeah. It was just in and out. And everybody performed like they were supposed to perform, but there was nothing really, really difficult about this. We were in clear weather. The winds were nice. The mm -hmm. we had close proximity to the beach. We had other rescue units in route. Literally, on this particular case, we could have sat there in a hover and monitored the situation and let other people do the work. But everything wasn't in place, and that's that's from a 2020 hindsight perspective kind of a deal that we could Agreed. have done that when we arrived. We didn't know all these details and every all the plays, but. For a first, if, if, if I look at it and I sit there and say, this is, this is my first time as a co-pilot out here in a live hoist, man, I can, I can see where that could be intimidating real quick. Yeah. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is like, as great as this case was, it wasn't your storm stories kind of a deal. It was just, it was a high intensity case that was done by a great crew and we overcame some obstacles and got a successful mission to it, but there wasn't anything really, really difficult about it. Does, it, does anybody, does anybody disagree with that? Uh, I, I mean, might, I, hey, I as the host right here, I might disagree with that. Just listen yeah. to what you guys are saying. I'm like mind blown right now. Okay. We were no, it, was, it was awesome. I, I, I'm not trying to attract anything from it. I'm just situation. sitting there going, That's we trained for job. this shit all the time. This yeah. is, you know, we did our job. We, we went out and did our job. the hover. Yeah. When you pull into a hover and you assess the situation, I mean, obviously, cool heads prevail. So it's like that's what we that's the mode we yeah. were all in. We were, hey, OK, we've got an emergency situation. It's not our emergency. So let's don't turn oh. this fucker into our emergency. Love it. OK, so it that that's well. the kind of a thing. And, you know, you just sit there and you approach all this stuff with that with that mindset and that mindset and that training and you, you come into you come into any given situation with those kind of mindsets and that kind of training and that kind of equipment and that kind of dedicated personnel behind you and you're going to be successful you're not going to sit there and flail about and pile one bad decision on top of another bad decision you're going to make good decisions and when those decisions don't come out the way you exactly wanted them to you pile on with more good decisions to overcome that, and then you have a successful outcome. And as a helicopter crew that had worked together before and that had superior training and superior equipment, that's exactly what we accomplished. We accomplished something that was completely unexpected, made some mistakes, corrected mistakes, and we had a successful outcome. And that's the bottom line story of this. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'm, Dempsey, I'm, I'm going to come back to you in one second, I promise. So, oh, no worries. Ernie, let me, let me get a little perspective from you. Uh, green, like 
a really good case, especially for a hoist operator with everything that you had to go through. Um, and I say that because you're looking at he like head signals, like, a, a, hey, give me a head nod and, and we'll go. And I, I've been the guy in the water and had to do that. And I've been the guy in the air and had to do that. So yeah, I understand both sides of it. Um, like for everybody else out there, like what would you tell them as far as advice, is, you know, coming into that case? What would you what would you copy and do it? Um, I think I mean, the biggest the biggest thing that I learned coming from that one is, as Dave said, always stay calm. You know, you I was an instructor for a long time as well. And you always teach your hoist operators, you know, regardless of what's going on down there, you keep that calm voice. If you're calm, the, the pilot's calm. The pilot's calm everything's good yeah you know, everybody is good <laughs> so you you keep your, you keep your monotone you don't get excited i mean right. i was pissing my pants but you, they couldn't tell <laughs> 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 i love yeah we got out of that we got out of that plane i probably stepped out with a boot full of piss but nobody yeah. would have known it because yeah. of my training you know and, nice. and that all goes back to the training <laughs> that's some great guys who, who who brought me up who taught me you know from day one don't let anybody know um, you, you paint the picture with your voice, you, you, you know, with your words, but they don't need to know that, that anything else is going on down there. Right. So, you know, that's, that's the biggest, the biggest takeaway was switching back to, okay. Yeah. We, we put ourselves in a situation. We, we kind of, we were kind of fucked there for, you know, and it probably wasn't as long as it seemed. I mean, obviously it seemed like an entire fucking lifetime that Marty was underwater, <laughs> but it might seem longer for him, <laughs> but <laughs> once once everything was okay, you've got it. You've got it. Like you know, like Kurt said, you, you're trained for this. You know what's going on. Let's get it done. And yeah. that's when you know. For me, it was back to let's do work. Let's do work right now. And I don't think I ever understood the severity of the the situation that we were in. You know, and how difficult. I mean, it was some challenging voices until you know a few mm -hmm. SAR cases later, where I was like, "Man, that that one was that was pretty difficult." Yeah. You know, Dave and I did work. We, yeah. we we did some work out there, and you know, to, to cable management to keeping the helicopter where we needed to keep it, to painting that picture for Dave so he knew what was going on, and we all did some fucking work. I mean, Kurt gave us the thumb. And he was doing <laughs> some work too. <laughs> that clear back and left. That, that's my job, guys. <laughs> but the rest of us are working our ass off, you know. Hey, hey, but but Kurt, Kurt has that radio twang that he does the best, man. He's got that. He's got that radio twang on there. So yeah. <laughs> not to take away from I'm Kurt, sure they're going clear left. Too. Yeah, clear left. Clear, clear, <laughs> clear left. But yeah, it was it, man. It was uh, we did work, and and you know, we walked away proud of what we did that day. It was uh, it was challenging. Yeah. Um, we could have easily sat seven and said, hey, this this isn't what we should do. We should let the, the ground assets do it or whatever. But, you know, we, we we didn't know what we didn't know at that time either. We didn't know right, that, that right. this was even an LE case. Yeah. I had no and, idea and, this was an LE case. So probably the second voice when I looked up and I saw the truck. I was like, what the hell is the truck doing here? You know, yeah. I, had, I had no clue. And what people What people need to understand on this one, too, is in that section of the beach, there are no lifeguards. Okay, and so the Coast Guard boats, Coast Guard regulations at that time, the boats that we had in the water uh, for that area, the smaller boats to get into there, they could not enter the surf line to effect a rescue. So if it came to surf line rescues, we were it. The only, the, the station has, uh, the small boat stations have trained swimmers. They're not rescue swimmers. Uh, they don't go through the extensive training. In fact, those guys, if they have to enter the water, they actually wear a harness tethered with a line yeah. that they could be kind of reeled in and pulled in from the people on the on the boats or from shore. So, uh, as, as yeah, we could have. I, I I know what Kurt and other people are saying. Yeah, we could have sat back there and hovered and said, "Hey, this is y'all's deal, not ours." But in essence, if you really think about it, and Coast Guard regulations, we were the only ones to really get these people off that boat unless we told them you got to jump in and make your way to shore. But by then you would have had people in rip currents and you would have had an old man and a young girl that probably would have drowned. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other two guys might've survived it, but, uh, and then you have the language barrier as well. They were all, they all spoke Spanish. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the challenges that all faced. And again, we made the decisions to do what we did because we knew our capabilities. 
we knew that if we didn't act and do something right then and there, we were going to run out of fuel. And it was going to be about a 35 to 45 minute minimum turnaround for us to go to another airport uh, close by, get gas, sh shut down, get gas, start back up and come back out on scene. So uh, could have been done other way, maybe, but there would have been a, it would have taken time to come up with that. And with the way that pilot house was coming off that trim boat, I don't know that those people had that time. So we acted, we were the first unit on scene, but we decided to take, as a, as a crew, decided to take the action that we took, you know, once we got on scene. And, and yeah, I mean, could there have been other ways? Quite possibly, but we all worked together and we, we got it done that day. That's awesome. That's this awesome. Is, this is very, very much the same as every other Coast Guard mission that every other rescue we've ever been dispatched on, either individually or as a team. As you go there, you look at it, you do what you can do up to the point that safety allows. And if it, if safety doesn't allow anything else, then they're released back to the sea. <laughs> okay. You know what? I, so I'm going to, I'm going to agree with you, but I might, I'm going to throw a little argument out there to you, Kurt. I just, I, because there's that safety line and that safety margin, but I always seem to be on the other side of it, pushing it as far as it can go. Just going to throw that out there. I'm just saying like, Hey, <laughs> I've, I brought back I brought back aircraft with broken windows out of them and all kinds of shit and, and I take it very seriously the fact that the Coast Guard regulation allows me to damage that aircraft if I am going to save a life and I have done just that I've broken aircraft to save life I've gotten myself in huge trouble with the Coast Guard because I made a decision to save a life instead of leave them there right. so I understand that there's a line there and you know it, it's just that's part of the aircraft commander decision making yeah. is I do have the authority to break rules in the case of a life saving mission, but I've also got to understand that I'm going to have to completely explain myself when I get back because I'm not the top of the food chain in this. Agreed. And that's a and, and, I'll say, and I'll say this for Kurt. I'll say this for Kurt. I mean, Kurt and I flew together a lot more after this. Like he said earlier, he was an instructor pilot, and I was a very green guy. I mean, Kurt is a guy that we didn't talk about this case much, but there were snippets of it that he used to continually develop me as a pilot. I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on Kurt and I have had this uh, talk on a personal level, but I'm going to put it out there that because there's several instructor pilots that are like this, and there's several that are not, but Kurt, Kurt made sure I knew the regulations. Yeah. He knew I knew how to back up my, he, he taught me how to back up my decisions if we had to go up into that gray area. Yeah. And the other thing that Kurt taught me that really um, I felt I tried to pass along the best of my ability throughout my career when I became an aircraft commander and continued on with my career was Kurt, Kurt not only made sure I knew the book and he knew because I was an academy guy that I could learn the book but he taught me how to fly the aircraft. Yeah. And that's one thing that Kurt really knew. Kurt knew the capabilities of the aircraft. We knew the limits of the aircraft, but what Kurt really taught me was the capability of the aircraft, which the aircraft was a lot more capable than the, uh, what the book said. We had our limits in the book, but, but uh, that, that's, and that's one thing in aviation that is so important. You know, the limits, the procedures, emergency procedures, everything that we follow is basic because of uh, knowledge of the aircraft in the systems. And it's also because of things that have happened, whether it be aircraft accidents, things like that. Those are the limits, the restrictions, the rules, the procedures. That's why they're there. And we learn those. But what's very important is for pilots to learn the capabilities of the aircraft. And that's one thing that Kurt was an expert on. And I'm, I'm a lucky one to be able to, uh, to uh, um, gain that knowledge that he had. And he taught that to me. That's awesome. You know, hey, I, let me back this up real quick. Let me back up here real quick. I got a comment on this. Okay, okay. I did not, I did not teach my pilots 
to disregard the limitation of the aircraft. Oh, I, I know, I to, know, I know. I taught him how to stretch the envelope. Stretch the that, envelope. Okay, that, that is, is that perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. And that is exactly what I'm talking about with safety. Like, it, I'm all about being safe, and, and I want to I want to come home just like everybody else. Like, and if there's anybody that says they don't want to come home, they're lying to you. You're, they're full oh, of shit, right? Everybody wants to well, come I home. Would, I, I'll go well, one I more thing and guys, say, go, go ahead and I'll say it. What I would tell guys is if you're only flying the aircraft as a station sedan, as a sedan, you're only flying the aircraft the way you're taught to fly it in flight school. You are never going to be prepared to fly that aircraft in extremist situations. So you better start fucking flying the aircraft and making it do what you want it to do right. when you have all the other environmental factors are in your favor control. because you're going to have to get out there and have environmental control factors taken away from you. And you're still going to have to fly that fucking aircraft. And you're going to have to fly it to a point where you haven't flown it before because that thing's going to depend on you to maneuver it, to get out of the bad situation successfully. So you better know how far you can push it. Yeah. And you better uh, yeah. Kurt, Kurt, Kurt saying, Kurt saying is you fly the aircraft you don't let the aircraft fly you. That's one of his sayings he used to do in his instructor pilot flights. And that's, I guess, that's what I was trying to say, not saying break the rules, you know, <laughs> just every day. No, you don't do that, you know, you know uh, but, but just like, yeah, Kurt said, you're gonna find yourself in situations where you're gonna have to get yourself out of, it's inevitable. This was a case where we found ourselves in situations that was it standard rescue operations in the Coast Guard? There were some in there, but there were some that was not because we had to react to the to the conditions right then and there, and we had to do what we had to do to save lives. And uh, that was a thing, and and that's something that uh, yeah, don't let the aircraft fly you. You fly the aircraft. And, and I, I'll I'll emphasize it like I'm don't I don't want anybody going out there putting themselves you know beyond the capability of their crew, their aircraft, their equipment. You know, that's not, that's not the point of this. And that's not the discussion. If that's what you're taking out of it, you're not listening. What we're saying is you have to be able to know your limitations and your limitations are probably a little further than most. My comfort level is a little higher than most. All right. I'm okay with certain, certain things. Um, I have flown with guys, pilots and air crew that are like, I'm not comfortable with that. Even though I am, they're not. Boom. That's our limit. That's as far as you go. It's it's that simple. So yep. and again to emphasize, their emergency is not our emergency. Don't make it your emergency. I can't I like I can't emphasize that enough. Thanks, Kurt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, all right. So. Let, let me get let me get to uh let me get to Marty. Marty, give us a little like uh, back like anything you would have done different. Anything that that j just recap anything having all the facts i mean yeah dave's entry point walking him into the water uh in a perfect world they would have known we were dealing with smugglers and not you know fishermen which is a horse of a different color yeah uh the hazards in the water some could be seen from the air some could only be seen in the water even if you look at the 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 sea conditions from the air getting in there and feeling them it was dramatically different i mean so really you did what you did and you made the best of it and you had to uh you just go down the flow chart well that changed recalculating yeah. you know well that changed recalculating and then you just make fast quick decisions and you and you prosecute the case uh, i think if we can take one thing away from all the dialogue so far a normal person will look at what we consider regular parameters and go, yeah, y'all are crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> if, if you look at what normal is for us. That, it, could, that could be where my previous comment came from. Like, I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's amazing what you get used to. I want to set Dempsey up for the set spike. Uh, I know the air crew is champing at the bit to find out what happened. We've been waiting 20 years. Yeah, you know, was that O2? Been waiting was, 20 no, years okay. to hear what it happened was, next. Wow. So I'd, I'd like you to uh, to tell us a little more about the AOR 
uh, we never talked about mileage, the proximity from Corpus to Port Mansfield, Mansfield to, uh, uh, to SPI, that adds a new dynamic to this discussion, how isolated we are in the middle of nowhere. And uh, there's one footnote as I was, we were putting gear away and I'm, I'm dragging my tired ass around the hangar deck and I'm putting my stuff on the, uh, my stuff on the drying rack. And this little guy comes running in. I've never seen him before. I don't know what agency he's with. Obviously, he's law enforcement because he's got the belt for it. Uh, dressed in a really nice polo, press pants, you know, just enough dude ads on his belt to look law enforcement. And he runs in and he says, hey, I'm looking for Nelson. And I'm just, I'm half asleep. I'm like, yeah, I'm Nelson. And guys, I mean, you know this, I've had dad bod before dad bod was cool. He looks right at my gut, looks back at my face and says, no, the rescue swimmer, Nelson. <laughs> my, I didn't say another word. I didn't say another word. I just look him in the face and he goes, oh, you're him. <laughs> and he goes, you really took, he, he says, he tells me, you really took this guy down hand to hand. That's double tough. He's got some anger issues. I said, well, he's selling human beings and trying to kill people. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's got some issues. Yeah. And then he ran by and went to the op center. We never saw him again. And I don't know who he was. So if Dempsey could enlighten us as to what exactly did we just fall into face first? So Dempsey, well, finish us off, brother. Come on. Well, that was one of the, uh, local coast guard investigative service agents that, uh, Marty had the privilege of meeting on the fly and uh, this case was turned over. Um, so the, the two people that you had issues with while swimming, Marty were the uh, were obviously the smugglers and the girl and the older man were, you know, the, the product oh, yeah. Yeah. as they, you know, as these disgusting people think of them, but they were actually the ones being uh, transported into the country. Uh, those two guys were taken into custody, placed under arrest, and the case evolved from there. That's all I can really say about it. Roger that. Huh? <laughs> those are not the only two arrests that took place. And we we had a lot of success from that case. It was very lucrative back then in uh, 0203 timeframe. So it built. Look at it in what fashion, yeah. What's that? Lucrative in what way? Lucrative in what way? Uh, stopping and catching some more people. Wow. So intel. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, there, okay, there so was not only intel from that case. There, there was actually tangible busts after that. No kidding. Oh. So, so for people listening, uh, this became a classified case, and that's why the descriptions get – can't continue yeah so we can tell but you about was, this uh, but then we're gonna have to kill you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what that's it, the reason where they, honestly we're the let's, only let's ones think left. about it from yeah. the sar perspective that's the reason we're the only ones left we had to kill everybody else that knew about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a good thing about it in the country <laughs> yeah. right, go ahead, go ahead, sorry sorry so but think about it at the end of the day we're all active duty coast guard we're all primary search and rescue, then law enforcement and everything. Would this have, you know, they should have been briefed. They should have known that if they were flying in that area, we were looking for this boat. I don't know where the loss of uh, communication broke down there. Maybe Kurt was probably sleeping during crew brief or during <laughs> changeover. It was, it, it was my, my rampant drug use at that time, you know? Hey, no, <laughs> negative, negative. <laughs> But, you know, we've all gone out on those cases and pulled in shady people. Would, it, would this really have changed their approach to it? We aren't the type of organization to sit back and, you know, watch somebody flounder. We're going to jump into work just like these guys did. Yeah. You know, and it, it sucks. You get to see it face to face. Well, you know, what's amazing to me is, is even after like an incredible case like this, um, you know what it did and 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 the waves the waves literally the waves no the uh like how the story progresses you know what happens after and you know we all 
everybody that's been involved in a case, you know, sometimes you never know what, what happens to your victims, your patients, your, you know, maybe they go on and do amazing things. And, and this case is a, a prime example of that. You, you have that Intel that you guys got, you know, saved so many more lives outside of the search and rescue side, which is mind blowing. It's awesome. So you guys are amazing. Holy it's shit. amazing to work with a great it's, it's amazing the things you can accomplish with a little bit of effort and a great team yeah wow you guys this story has been just mind-blowing i have loved every bit of it uh I, do you guys got anything else to add because other than that we'll sign off and i'll call it good and, and then i'm calling each one of you for a personal interview so yeah for sure all awesome. right cool yeah Said all I know is these guys are drinking free forever. I love them all. Thanks for getting here. <laughs> nice. I love it. Well, gentlemen, well, thanks, man. I, I can't thank you enough, guys. Thank you so much for coming on, uh, just sharing the story with us. Holy smoke. I um I'm chosen to talk to all you guys again. So let's make this happen. All right. All right. Nice. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. See you later, guys. All right. You got it. <laughs> And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Real Rescue Podcast. Please take a minute to like, subscribe, and hit that share button. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com. That's jason at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page, at The Real Rescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember... When that star alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard.